Climate change is no fiction, but a new anthology, Cli-Fi, Canadian Tales of Climate Change, has opted to put the imaginative powers of fiction writers to work to help readers understand the extent of the climate challenge. It's a novel approach, pun intended, and it brings three of the people involved to our studio tonight to reflect on what writers can bring to the conversation. And with that, let's welcome Bruce Meyer, author of more than 50 books, editor of the Cli-Fi Anthology and the first poet laureate of Barrie, Ontario. And contributing writers, Kate Story, whose third novel, This Insubstantial Pageant, is forthcoming this year. And Peter Timmerman, professor in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University, and we're delighted to welcome all of you to you. TVO tonight. Thanks for joining us around our table here. This anthology series, how did it come into being to begin with? Well, Exile Editions decided, you know, as a small publisher trying to stay afloat, that they would try to be as inclusive as possible with as broad a range of topics as possible. And in the case of this particular book, um, uh, Margaret Atwood came to Barry. This is how it came, came, came to Margaret be. Atwood Mar came Mar to Margaret Barry, Atwood Ontario. came to Barry, and she spoke at a, a literary festival conference put on by the students at a high school. And uh, she said, look, we're facing the greatest problem, the greatest challenge of our times. And the greatest challenge of our times is climate change. And yet writers are not responding to it imaginatively. Mm -hmm. And why aren't they doing this? And I think I mentioned in the introduction that, you know, climate is a conversation. It's not a place. You know, the, nature is not a place. It's, it's, a, it's a conversation. And because of that, I think, the way in which you change people's perceptions about how to deal with, uh, with nature, how to deal with landscape, how to deal with the world they live in, is to change the way they imagine it. So Margaret Atwood literally planted Mar the seed? Margaret Atwood planted the seed. And uh, she said, look, where are the authors? Where's the responses? So I said to Michael Callahan, the publisher of Exile Editions, I said, look, why don't we do something about this? We're doing an anthology series. We're doing books about zombies. We're doing <clears throat> books about you know, Canadian noir and so forth. Why aren't we doing something about climate change? And he got back to me and he says, well, there's nobody writing about climate change. Uh -huh. And I said, precisely. And I said, this is why we have to be the first. And we have to start, you know, getting the beachhead to deliver to, you know, into the sort of the psychological and imaginative vocabulary of Canadian literature, the ideas of what are the consequences of what we're doing to nature and how do we respond to that, both in a human sense and also in an imaginative sense. How'd you pick the writers? Open call. Well, I put out a call to Canadian authors, and I know, uh, you know Peter and Kate who are with us today, um, they responded, and I, we got about 300, uh, more or less 300 submissions, and I read through them all, and these were the ones that were the best. All right. Uh, everybody knows what sci-fi is. Who came up with cli-fi? Cli-fi was a term coined by an American filmmaker and environmentalist who lives in Taiwan. His name is Dan Bloom. And after I put out the call for Cli-Fi, because Atwood had called it Cli-Fi, after I put out the call, he wrote to me and said, by the way, I'm the guy that invented the term Cli-Fi. Hmm. And um, it's a term that had been picked up by Atwood in you know, her Orcs and Crake series and so forth. Hmm. And uh, it was a term that had been used by uh, Ian McEwan, for example. Uh, even Helen Humphreys had done a whole series of short vignettes about what they called freeze fairs in London. Uh, England throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance era. And as a result of this, I, I struck up this conversation with Dan, and I said, look, why don't you write a forward for it? And he says, no, I'll write a very brief afterward. I just want to see it out there. I want to see this whole thing um, happen in terms of, of changing people's perceptions about the way they think of the world. Gotcha. Well, let's, okay. shall we talk to a couple of people Please. who made the cut yeah. here? Yeah. Okay, Peter. I mean, you're used to dealing in, in like real facts and real figures when you right. teach at York University. Right. So why are you getting involved in quote unquote fiction? Well, for me, I was, I was in, in the middle of uh, down, downtown and I was thinking there are all these big buildings full of estate planners and trust fund managers and so on who are working really hard to um, make sure that the money that they are generating is going to their children and grandchildren, but they're not going to give them a planet to spend it on. So I thought, this is strange. So I thought I would create a terrorist group called Sins of Our Fathers, run by a woman called Cordelia Koch, after the Koch brothers, who some of you may know are very rich people in the Koch United States. Koch brothers, you mean? In, Koch in the brothers, States. sorry, Koch yeah. brothers. Okay. Yes, so that was like part one. And then the second part was a historical memory of uh, Oliver Cromwell, who ran the Puritan Revolution in the 1650s. And he died in 1658. And then 
Three years later, they brought his father, or they brought his son, Charles II, in. And about two years after that, Parliament, sucking up to him, dug up the dead body of Cromwell and his couple of his friends, and they hung it, and then they beheaded him and stuck the head on Westminster Hall for like 60 years, and birds <laughs> came and pricked it. So I thought, well, that would be a really good story. So in my story, um, <clears throat> it sort of starts off in Canada, and they uh, exhumed the body of uh, Stephen Harper and uh, various oil and gas executives. This is, takes place in 2060, not today. And uh, they slowly but surely uh, get rid of um, science deniers, uh, all kinds of people like that. And then it shifts in the United States. They, uh, they go to what was once Texas, which is now a completely abandoned area. They go to the George W. Bush Library. They burn it to the ground. They go to his, his ranch, and they sow it with salt. And they um, exhume all the bodies of uh, senators, a loose president or two, and a variety of other people. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's, about, it's partly about revenge, but it's also about, do these people actually think they're going to get a, history will let them get away with wasting what I call the lost so time, the th 20 or 30 years of this it? This totally explains uh, what my next question, which was going to be, what, you know, <laughs> what does fiction allow you to do that apparently facts don't? And here you go. You're getting your revenge through I'm fiction. I'm getting my revenge. Well, okay. What jumped out about, at me from, about Peter's story was that it's written as a scientific report. Yes. And I teach scientific writing at Georgian College and, you know, writing reports and so forth. And I got it immediately. It, it, it's, it's beautiful. Well, as Peter put it at the launch, it's Swiftian in its nature. Uh, but it's abs it, at first, it's absolutely straight-faced until you start to get these... Whatever it's a report jokes. to the United Nations, uh, yeah. the Emergency Council that now runs the Earth in 2060, about what I call report on the outbreaks, and it's about what happens around the world. So okay. That, Kate's story, what's your story? Well, um, I saw the call for submissions. I'm, I'm the kind of uh, artist, I work, I work best to assignment. I love an assignment. I love limitations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if somebody just said, oh, write about anything you want, it would be terrible. I don't know if I'd ever come up with a thing. But as soon as there's a theme or, or a limitation of some kind, uh, I find it really stimulating. And naturally, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about climate change. I mean, I think any, any person living on the planet is concerned about climate change, um, whether they're working hard to deny it or, or, or you know, really concerned about it. Um, I actually, for this story, I'm going to tell you now. Uh, it was actually a failed story. It was one that I wor worked and reworked a few times. It wasn't working. And uh, I'm from Newfoundland. I'm, I'm from St. John's. And uh, I have spent quite a bit of time in Gross Morn. And I'd done with one of my brothers this hike uh, uh, in this place called the Tablelands, which is quite an extraordinary landscape. And Newfoundland in general is an extraordinary landscape. And uh, of course, I imprinted on that landscape growing up there. So, uh, but the story still wasn't working with just the, the landscape itself. And then when I added the element of climate change, a near future kind of climate change scenario, the whole thing came into focus for me. I threw a great deal of the story out, and uh, just the, the two main characters remained. Um, so it's for me, a lot of it's about home, about Newfoundland, uh, uh, about the landscape. But also, there's this thing that happens, uh, and it happen it's happening in some of these stories here. There's often, a, uh, in climate change fiction, this idea that things won't be as bad in Canada as are going to be in the United States which isn't necessarily true. That's a bit of a southernist perspective. I mean, things are really dire in the Arctic right now, for example. However, Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland, not, not Labrador, is actually not experiencing climate change quite as severely as other areas of the world for various reasons that may not continue to be so as we move into the future. Um, so in my near future, it's, things are maybe a little better in Newfoundland, and there are climate change refugees um, arriving there from other places. Hmm. A little reversal of what's uh, generally happening in Newfoundland, where people are leaving. Climate change refugees. Yeah. This is a new term that have you coined? I don't think I've coined. Well, have I? I, do I you didn't know? see it no. elsewhere. So I mean, this uh, talks about environmental refugees now and climate refugees. Climate refugees. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. your climate change refugees end up leaving know. Canada and going to Newfoundland. Yes, and yeah. also I posited that the big one has happened on the west coast, so that of course brings some more people. And then the other thing I posit in the story is. Um, I called it psychogeography. Again, maybe that's a thing that already exists. Um, you know, you mentioned it in your introduction, Bruce, thing, you know, migraines, for example, yeah. which you can get from a low-pressure system. I know I have. And uh, the full moon, and we all know this, the police have extra people on during the full moon. If you work in, in the mental health wing at a hospital, things happen during the full moon. We, we, we are affected by, by the environment. It's not separate from us the way we like to think of it. So then I, I just push that envelope a little further. So in my story, people are... are are affected on a very visceral level by what's happening. Can I get you also to 
to help us understand if there is a distinction between fantasy novels, which I think we get, and sci-fi novels, which we get, and cli-fi, which will be a new thing to a lot of people. Is there a difference among those three? I think cli-fi sits more with science fiction because you generally have to do some kind of real world research. Uh, it has to be based on something real. On the other hand, you know, with my psychogeography, I'm, I may be going a little bit into a fantastical realm, but um, it's, it's one of those areas, that's why we use speculative fiction as a term, because then you can do all these things and not worry too much about it. Robert but, Sawyer has said, he's the science fiction writer, yeah. has said that if you're going to write good science fiction, you have to get the science right. Yes. Um, and in the case of this particular book, the original title for it was called The Gota Glass. And I don't know whether you know, but, but Wolfgang von Goethe, the, the who, author of Faust, among other things. G-O-E. G-O-E-T-H-E, Goethe. Goethe, Goethe. Okay. Um, Goethe uh, uh, invented this mechanism. It was kind of like a teapot with colored liquid that you hang on the wall. And it's actually more accurate than mechanical barometers in terms of measuring the high and low <laughs> pressures and the changes in weather. And, of course, Michael said, well, nobody's going to understand what a Goethe glass is, even though I explained it in the introduction, so that came out. But um, uh, when Dan Bloom came along and said, well, why don't you just call it cli-fi, Michael agreed with that. But there is the sense that somewhere at the basis of, this is what also caught me about both Kate and Peter's stories, is that the science was there. Well, that's what yeah. I wanted to pick up on yeah. with you, Peter, because mm -hmm. obviously with a novel, you can basically do and say whatever the hell you want, and whether it's rooted in fact doesn't necessarily matter. But is your story, in fact, rooted in the best science available today on climate change? I think so. I mean, I think one of the, we have this great tension in this, in this genre, which is what I call this distinction between preemptive mourning. Are we, are we dealing with something that is, we, we're pretty sure it's going to happen, and we're now projecting the future, or is it an imagination of resistance? Are we dealing with uh, attempting, as Bruce said at the beginning, to try and get people to imaginatively and creatively think about this looming situation. Mm. And I think that's the dark side of this, um, of this cli-fi. But there's also this humorous side, because otherwise we're going to burn out for the next 15 or 20 years while we're watching this. I mean, for me and my students, the real question is, what kind of a story are we going to live with for the rest of the 21st century? And, and what's the narrative? And part of uh, these activities that we're doing is to try and can we come up with a, a resilient story that we can live with or, or play within? And I think that's, that's our, I think that's, a, that, that, that's the drive of a lot of the work we're doing. Kate, can I follow up with you? How important was it for you to have your cli-fi story actually based in the best available real facts of the day? Well, it was very important. I wanted it to be a Newfoundland that anyone who's been to Newfoundland would recognize. I said it in a near future. Um, if, if you go into far future stuff, you, you, can, you can get maybe slightly more fantastical. Um, but I didn't want it to be like, oh, that could never happen. Um, I certainly wanted, uh, I wanted people to, to think, oh, that's real. And I did, and this is the kind of thing uh, with short fiction that frustrates me. Uh, sometimes you just don't have the space. But I wanted there to be some micro-interventions. I, I think I have... What, what I, does that mean, micro -intervention? Well, being a Newfoundlander, I'm very familiar with mega-projects that are supposed to save everything, the latest one having been offshore oil. We all know how that's gone. So um, there have been various, various mega-projects that were supposed to save Newfoundland through the years. So I'm not that fond of mega-solutions. Uh, and I think with climate change, there's, you hear all the time these things, oh, if only all the roofs in all the cities were white instead of black, it would reflect, you know, there's things like this. And, and in, in the Netherlands, I believe, there, there's experiments in using solar panels to surface roads. So I threw that in. I just thought, what if, what if and hardy wheat, there, there are actually uh, a couple of areas in Newfoundland where you can actually grow uh, agriculture, actually, <laughs> agricultural areas, there's some soil. So I thought, well, if, if it did warm a little in Newfoundland, you could maybe grow some wheat. So to so look at, at these sort of micro-interventions um, that, that, that could possibly be positive rather than, as you suggest, you know, there's, there's a tendency to just want to be very, uh, oh, I mean, it's such bleak. a tragedy. It's so <laughs> bleak. It's so hard to try to find any yeah. uh, hope sometimes. So I wanted to kind of put a couple of those in and I made sure those were based on some and reality. It was the human element that spoke to me in all the stories that I, I chose for the anthology because you can have, I mean, you can have an apocalyptic vision that ends in despair 
but what does that prove? And, you know, the whole time I was editing the thing, um, I kept hearing Faulkner's Nobel speech going on in the background, you know, about the sound of man's puny and inexhaustible voice still, you know, clamoring to be heard. And that's what I think all the stories had. It I don't want to give away any endings here, yeah. Bruce, no, but, 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 but do you, still... did you feel an obligation to kind of have a quote-unquote happy ending so that people no, didn't feel lost? not necessarily a happy ending, but the humane ending. Humane ending. The, the idea that somehow the humanity of the characters speaks through the situation in which they find themselves, mm -hmm. whether it's through humor, whether it's through realization, whether it's through coming to some sort of understanding about how they have to cope. Um, not, not so much a happy ending, but the human ending. You know the world, obviously, as an environmentalist, and you right. study the, the right. effects of climate change on the entire world. So I want to ask you a question about Canada and whether there's anything particular to Canada that makes it a good place to base cli-fi stories. Um, one thing, and, and there are variations, I think. One is there's probably a little more time in Canada, so there's a little freedom uh, to make certain uh, things happen. We have all this vast amount of space, but the Arctic is uh, this early warning system for what's going on. So we have these these tensions between the, this kind of scientific mm -hmm. idea and the rest of it. And then there's all all this stuff. And some of the stories we have stories about Canada being defended against the United States coming and taking our water, and or all these stories I think have a very strong Canadian focus. Um, the provinces and so on, and uh, I think that's a that's a cr that's a crucial thing. And I think one of the things that's really interesting, with from a scientific point of view, is again the struggle over fact. The struggle over fact in this country has only subsided temporarily, uh, and what's happening south of the border about scientific fact is part of the struggle over not just climate fiction, but climate fact, and I think that's part of the, the struggle. Here. And coming back to Atwood again, mm -hmm. I mean, her, her survival thesis was all about the impact of the environment on individuals. She's been... You should just take 30 seconds and explain what survival well, is. Well, survival was her, her book that appeared in the early 1970s, and it was a thematic guide to Canadian literature, and she says in there that, in fact, the central theme, I guess, or the central recurring idea or issue in Can Canadian literature is that we keep coming back to this issue of how do we survive in our environment? Mm -hmm. And now the whole question is not just about how do we, you know, uh, build a lean-to or how do we, you know, uh, build our own fish hooks and our own trap lines. It's a question now of how do we survive a world that we are in the process of ruining? Hmm. And that's the scary thing, because now you're not just dealing with the death of the individual, you're dealing with the extinction of, in fact, the human race. And it's, it, it, I'm not putting, a, I'm not enlarging, I'm not hyperbolizing the whole issue. The problem is in Canada, we are very, very aware of our environment and our weather. For instance, I live in Barrie. And every morning when I wake up and it's snowing sideways, I know what the weather is. Um, and I think that when we're in, even in the cities, we tend to get insulated uh, as to how we perceive nature and how we perceive the environment. Mm -hmm. And really, I think what is coming out of this is a transformation of how we perceive nature, that nature, as I said, is not a place, it's a mm -hmm. conversation. Kate, yeah. I want to ask you about two sort of a kind of a push-me-pull-you thing that's happening here. On the one hand, dystopian novels are huge right now, and television series and films, anything which shows the world coming to an end for a variety of reasons, whether it's zombies or whatever, is very hot. On the other hand, there is a great chunk of the population, certainly in Canada and I bet beyond, that has had it hearing stories about climate change. How do you resolve all of that as you try to make a story that is both impactful about climate change and dystopian all at the same time? Well, I think as Bruce was sort of uh, talking about there, really it comes down to characters and to people. That's something that, that as a reader and as a writer we can do uniquely. You have a very intense uh, imaginative experience when you read something. Um, when you watch, uh, I mean, I love documentaries. I love uh, fictional movies. Uh, television is terrific. Um, but, you know, I, I walk away seeing Angelina Jolie's face, you know, very vividly. But I, I, I don't insert myself into that narrative particularly. Whereas when I read, even if the character is very different from me, you end up, uh, you end up putting yourself into, into their shoes in this way. So I think, I think that literature does have a place in this, this, this conversation about climate change. 
Um, but if it's about the characters as well as the climate change, you have to have that human element, I think. Mm. Um, and I think there's a real appeal to, 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 to massive apocalyptic, the world is over kind of stuff because of, of the idea of wiping the slate clean. Then we don't have to do the work. Wouldn't that be fabulous? We'd be off the hook. We wouldn't have to live with what we've done. And I think as adult humans, it, it really behooves us to, uh, to take that stuff seriously. And in fact, I mean, there's a young woman, I think she's nine years old, in India who's taking the Indian government to court for climate change. Hmm. That's happening right now. And I'm so excited by this girl. Um, and uh, this is happening in other places in the world where environmental groups are actually taking governments to court for not addressing climate change. So I think there is actually some hope and, 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 and movement forward um, that, that, that is the counter to that apocalyptic vision of, well, we'll just wipe the slate clean and, and start again. Maybe I'll be a survivor. You always imagine you'll be one of the survivors, don't you? There is a problem with that. And the problem is that virtually all of these films and apocalyptic films are really ultimately dealing with whether or not a husband will get back to his, with his wife or the small <laughs> child who has disappeared. Meanwhile, millions of people have died yeah. and there's frost everywhere or whatever it might be. But as long as they get back together again, preferably in the family car, um, then everything will work out in the end. Well, that's The Walking Dead right there. And that's, that's, that's yeah. all, virtually all of these. And mm -hmm. I think from, a, from an interesting tension for writers is that writers are very good at thinking about human relationships. And one of the interesting things about science fiction, certainly historically, is trying to deal with the environment as an environment without it always being about human relationships, which is hmm. interesting tension. You know, we don't no, want to imagine our own possibility for failure. And I think this is the big issue that's behind climate change fiction. So are you forcing is, us to do that with this anthology? I am, I am, I am asking us to sort of say, look, what are the, what, how do we get out of this? Not just as human beings, but how do we get out of this as the collective, you know, human race? How do we fix what we have done? You know, I made the point that when you take, you know, the, you know, the oil out of the earth, you're not putting it back into the earth, you're putting it into the air. It's got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Waste is, in fact, I mean, waste is the product of success. We've been a very successful, you know, species. But in, our, in the process of our success, what we are ending up with is our own failure. And I'm saying, okay, how do, we, how do we manage that? How do we get around that? And the first step is, in fact, to imagine, okay, this is what the world could look like. Now, the next step is in, in getting and generating the, the creativity and the imagination to start finding solutions then the next step is, okay, what are the solutions? How do we make those things possible? Not just on, you know, on, a, on, a, on a narrative level, on a, on a story level, but how do we make them possible on a broad human level? Well, Peter, I know this is obviously yeah. the seminal issue of your entire life right now, yeah, but I, I, I do wonder what you think about those that you have not been able to engage with the same amount of fervor that you clearly have for this issue and, and whether you think this book can help do that. At this point, I'll try almost anything. Uh, no, I, I, I think the fiction and the literary way of thinking about the natural world is, is absolutely crucial. It's trying to break into it. And, and, and the people who are on the other side or people who d disagree, they're locked into a very powerful narrative themselves. And so one of the things you have to do is keep chipping away at the, at the, uh, the underpinnings of this of this narrative, and scientifically, that has been chipped away dramatically, and depending on how strong your other narrative is, and and I think the rest of it is is this, maybe it's a slow drip of imagination on this on this rock of um, ignorance. Well, the friend of mine, who's a poet, David Webel, um, he says that said that the hardest thing to imagine is ourselves, and yet here we are, you know, turning our backs or pretending not to notice what is happening. And that's, it, it's the same situation, I think, if you want to compare it to something historical, is to Edmund Burke in the 18th century, suddenly saying that the mind is far larger than anything we can imagine, that the imagination's far larger than anything we've engaged in. Now I'm saying, here's something else that we can engage in, that we can turn our imaginations to, that will test us, and will test the, you know, the strength and the depths of our just of our powers as human beings to be creative. So you couldn't just write a happy little tale like Come From Away, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we need our Come From Aways. We need them too. Have you seen that? No, I'm dying to. Oh, yeah. You I'll gotta, get down there. As a Newfoundlander, you've got to see it. I've got to see it. I've got to see it. I hear, no, I'm not going to say a word. 
<laughs> but that's such a that, that is a beautiful, wonderful, uplifting story about Newfoundlanders. Mm -hmm. And you are you're kind of hitting the other side of that coin, which is a you know distressing apocalyptic view of what happens to the country and and it all ends up in Newfoundland. It's a bit odd, don't you think? Yeah, but you know, it, it's this this is this is what's happening. People are moving, people are crossing borders. This is what's happening right now. It's been going on for years, you know. Hmm. I mean, there's even analysis of the Rwandan conflict that it really is about water and land, hmm. you know. Hmm. Um, there's so many conflicts going on in the world right now that really come down to, to climate change in so many ways and overpopulation. Hmm. Is there any question? I mean, we've seen this, I don't know how much of you follow this sort of drama uh, over the last couple of weeks with Brett Stevens, who's the new op-ed columnist for the New York Times, who wrote a, his very first piece, yes. was sort of putting out there, he wasn't taking that position, but he was sort of saying if you, if you in any way sort of ask any questions about what's happening with climate change, you know, you, you are asking for a whole, you know, case of, uh, right. I, I was going to swear there, but I better not do that, but you're asking for trouble, let's put it that way. Is any questioning behind the, the theories of climate change acceptable today in your view? That's what our scientists spend their whole time doing, is questioning, questioning this whole situation. Mm -hmm. um, if you read the issues of nature in the last three or four weeks, it's all been about wh where, where have we gone wrong with our data and so on. This is a narrative, and the narrative was created by Ronald Reagan in the United States in the 1980s, it was associated with acid rain, and it was, let us work out a way of getting this science um, to stop thinking about this science. And what they did was they said, ah, science is about questioning and lack of certainty and so on, and so we can keep this going. And they've been keeping it going for 30 years with a lot of money about that science is in fact very difficult and is uncertain. Every scientist will say, we're not absolutely certain, that's just how it works. But they took it as a, as a strategy. And the strategy is we can, we can make this Eventually, we will perhaps possibly come to a decision somewhere further down the road, which I call the lost time in this story. And, and they keep pushing this time further and further back to the point where it will become certain one day, but you don't want to be there on that day. Well, I'm absolutely certain about one thing. This was worth reading. So I want to congratulate Bruce Meyer for getting this done. He's the editor of Cli-Fi, Canadian Tales of Climate Change, and two of the authors, Kate Story and Peter Timmerman who also happens to be in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University. Good to have all of you around our table at TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.